We're back again doing another video. <laughs> Different location. Um, this is feeling like a, a, a tour of Hamilton. <laughs> we've got a mosque over there, we've got a church over there, um, the playground just out of sight. And I think this is probably a good opportunity to ask you about um, the New Zealand um, New Zealand um, Constitution Party's ideas on housing and um, housing has been a big issue and still is a big issue in this country and it looks like it's going to be a big issue for some time yet. I don't um, see why it should. It's a yeah. simple fix. Um, <laughs> just because it's a simple fix doesn't mean it's going to get fixed easily. <laughs> um, uh, it needs the okay. right, I think it needs the right people to do the right things to fix it simply. Correct. Um, sometimes we as human beings like to take the most difficult route to fix a problem and then realise, oh, we could have done that in five minutes, Correct. three months ago. You know? <laughs> uh, the biggest problem we have in New Zealand at the moment, when we're talking about housing, is infrastructure. A lot of the big builds overseas have taken up or sucked out what available uh, skilled personnel we had. Um, our carpenters, our bricklayers, oh, yeah our electricians, our plumbers, our roofers, uh, all of those have been uh, sucked out and they've gone, sent them to Kuwait or they've yeah. been attracted by the big money in Kuwait and uh, other places around the world and so we actually have a deficit. Regardless of what industry, we're talking about housing obviously, regardless of what industry uh, has a deficit resourceful people will always find a way to solve the problem yeah. and they'll just find an alternative way and sometimes that alternative way is quite revolutionary but at all material times it requires a sacrifice I don't know if you've ever seen a movie called The Darkest Hour yes I have actually uh, it was about Winston Churchill Yeah. when he uh, was given the position of Prime Minister and at that time they were heading into war yep. and they committed their military force uh, to uh, the engagement and uh, the Germans uh, were uh, more prepared than the English so much so that the Germans pushed them back to Normandy and uh, they found that I don't know how many thousands of troops were um, uh, pushed back to the beach and they couldn't get home. And uh, Winston Churchill knew that if we, they couldn't get their people off that beach that they would lose uh, the majority of the armed forces. They would either be killed or they would uh, be uh, sent up to military prison camp. Yep. And then they would be forced into a position where they would have to negotiate a cessation of, uh, of war but on terms that favoured the Germans. Yeah. And the problem was not winning the war, the problem was rescuing their men that were labouring on the beaches of non Normandy, Norm was Normandy, it? Yeah. What's it? I think that was the one, yeah. He didn't have the resources the military resources to do it and he had this uh, idea that came to mind well if we can't rescue them uh, from a, uh, as a military force yeah. as a military power is there any other way we can rescue them and he came to the conclusion that well, they could if they look to their civil people yeah. uh, for the solution and he asked the uh, person in charge if you could make an appeal to the civil community and ask that they would commit their launches, their oh, boats, oh, their fishing boats, fishing floors, any any, boat anything that floated, floated, they could get their people back home. Yeah. And uh, the civil community responded. Yeah. And it was quite impressive how that all happened. But what he saw was a problem that needed to be solved his government could not solve it yeah his military forces and uh, 
uh, uh, generals, for the want of a word, could not solve it. So he looked to the people. And the people had the resources, the will, and, and the, the desire, desire to, to, to solve the problem. And not only did they commit their boats and their ships to the engagement, but they committed human resource, yeah. monetary resources, their own personal finances to get the job done. And they weren't remunerated or compensated for it. No. And there were even a few people, a few civilians that, that died in the process of, of yeah. doing it. Yep. Yeah. One saving grace was that they had an agreement between the two countries that they would not attack civilians. And, that's, yeah. and even though Germans had uh, uh, control of the airways, uh, they knew that they would not, they would honour the agreement, and that they would not attack civilians. Yeah. And he was able to rescue almost everyone stranded on that beach. Yeah. So on the on the issue of housing, if we relate this back to housing in New Zealand, the problem can be sorted if enough people want the problem sorted. Correct. Um, if the government cannot solve the problem because they lack the infrastructure to do so and their um, agent for solving the problem is Housing New Zealand. Yeah. This house, if Housing New Zealand cannot solve the problem, what does government do? Well, it's simple, do what Winston Churchill did. But the question is, will the government do that? Yeah, the first step, I think, is they need to admit that they can't fully solve the situation by themselves they had and acknowledge build, they right? need, need help. Yeah. They had Kiwi build, yeah. they had housing New Zealand, but they can't solve it. No. And the only way you can solve it is that you look outside the square. Yeah. And you need to be, if I could use the word, humble enough to admit that you don't have the resources, that you need to find an alternative way. Yeah. And that alternative way has always been to look to the people to uh, contribute to the solving of that yeah. problem. And then the people themselves, us, the general public, as a group, need to acknowledge that we have a responsibility in sorting this out because the yeah. people we're, we're helping to sort this out with or for are fellow New Zealanders. Fellow yeah. people that you could just as easily be in the same situation as if circumstances were different. Yep. Right. I don't believe that the right solution is forcing New Zealanders to undertake a humanitarian uh, uh, cause, yeah. to take up with the gauntlet, so to speak. Yeah. But I do believe that they have the answer to the problem. If there are people that are homeless, they've got nowhere to live, they live in the streets, or there's nine, 10, 20 people living in a house of two or three bedrooms, that's not an ideal situation. No. Because it causes emotional and uh, psychological harm and duress on those who suffer the most. And those who are going to suffer the most are the children and the women. Yeah. And that then just Escalates. breeds a situation, a negative situation in our society and creates a downward slide for the standards we um, idolise in our, in, our, in our country, yep. the, the, the better standards of you know, being able to safely walk down the street without having any problems, um, living in, in, in good conditions, um, all these sorts of things are affected by the by um, things like this housing crisis because the housing crisis itself and the, the people who are having to live in these adverse situations are the breeding ground for future problems. Social oppression always creates social oppression. Yeah. And the only way to solve it is to solve it in an appropriate way. Yeah. If the government cannot solve it, it looks to its people. And um, just as Winston Churchill uh, asked the the community to offer their boats, their resources, their money to do that. There is no reason why we cannot ask the New Zealand people to do likewise. There are some who can make contributions, some who cannot. Yeah. But unless you ask, you will not get uh, a solution to the problem. 
Yeah. If you, as a government, cannot solve yeah. it. It's like they say in sales, no matter how much you talk to the customer, eventually at some point you've got to ask for the sale. And Correct. that's when you find out whether you're going to get it or not. Correct. I can imagine that there are quite a lot of people who are currently unemployed, who used to work in the building industry. They've got talent, skills and, and human resources. I can imagine that there are building construction companies that have a, maybe a surplus of workers that can contribute. Yeah. I can imagine that there are um, uh, companies that have surplus uh, supplies who can make a contribution. Yeah. In the 50s, when the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints decided to build uh, a college and a temple at Church College at uh, Temple View, yeah. they didn't have all the resources they needed to build. Oh, okay. And the community offered their assistance. Many of the building supplies, they gave uh, building supplies freely. Oh, okay. Hundreds and thousands of dollars worth were okay. given by the community with no thought of payment or return because they saw a need at that time of having a, a religious-centered education system for children who came from rural areas who would not otherwise get it. We're not okay. talking about um, uh, religion education in the sense, we're talking about proper uh, education, right? Yeah. And if the church was willing to buy the land and, and make uh, a significant contribution, this community made the decision to help. Okay. And they gave a lot of their time, a lot of their um, resources to make it happen. I know of many people who are not members of the church who lived on the East Coast, for example, one person in particular, their family, they built a church over there and then the mother found out that uh, the church here in New Zealand, Hamilton were building a uh, chapel, uh, a college at yeah. Temple View and she said to her husband, I need to go and make a contribution. Oh, okay. And she, so she took six months off from yeah. her family, came up here, she paid for her own housing, paid for her own food and she went and helped build the college. Yeah. wasn't even a member of the church and her husband said to her why are you doing it and she said this will be my tithing to the Lord okay so I don't believe that the New Zealand government has the answer all the answers to all things but I do believe that the community by and large has the answers yeah. and what we need to do is ask the community, ask the community. what can we do to solve the problem yeah I uh, every year I I work uh, last couple of years I've um, taken time out from practicing as a lawyer and I've uh, returned to the, my uh, traditional trade. I paint and plaster and at the moment I work for Anytime Fitness and I'm the maintenance uh, guy there. I do all the maintenance in all the gyms. Okay. But every year for the last 10, 15 years I've taken one month out and in that month I've gone to work on someone's house for free. Okay. Uh, build a part of it, whatever it needs, plaster, paint it, whatever it needs, do the landscaping, uh, anything that needs to be done to get that home more habitable for yeah. the family. And uh, a lot of the families I don't even know, haven't even met before. Yeah. But I made it a conscionable decision that I would take some time out in the year and I would work on somebody's home. And that was my way of giving back. After my daughter Candace passed away, she went to America for holiday and she uh, did not survive a, a drowning incident. So I okay. had to go back and get her and bring her home. And uh, every year since, I've taken time out and I've helped re uh, renovate someone's home. And this is my way of saying to the community, thank you for helping me. For two years I couldn't work. Yeah. I uh, was very depressed and it's taken me a couple of years to come right. But during that time, I was on the dole. Uh, people would bring me, f me and my family food, and someone gave me a car. Okay. And so, uh, uh, 10 years before that, every year for 10 years, I renovated someone's home. Yeah. Uh, seven years after the incident, I've taken time out to renovate somebody's home. I have a social conscience. Most New Zealanders have that social conscience. Yeah. If we need, if we have 
in our community, people that are homeless, let's go build them a home. Yeah. I think the other thing is people need to feel that they can do these things. I think nowadays a lot of people feel that their input's not going to be accepted or or that, that um, they might be shunned by another part of the community for put, having that input. And I think a lot of people need to feel that... Um, they can? They can do it. If they've got a skill and they've got a desire to do it, just go out and, and participate in I the way that, that you can because it's actually good for yourself. It's a, it's, people think, oh, yeah, it's giving to the community. To be honest, I've done a lot of community photography, and, and to be honest, I think, for me, I get a lot of value from it. I get a lot from it myself as far as how I feel and the feeling of contributing to helping people have something they wouldn't otherwise have yep. is actually really nice. I think that help needs to be organised yeah. properly, orchestrated properly, and this is where local council comes in. Yeah. And I believe that it can be done if the local council makes a decision to do it. I yeah. think there needs to be a collaboration between uh, uh, central government who have control over the lands, free up some lands. Yep. I don't believe uh, doubling the population of Hamilton, New Zealand, just to uh, meet the needs of unemployed, is going to uh, uh, help uh, the other uh, Hamiltonians yeah. who uh, have to now deal with a double in size of population. Yeah. I don't believe that that's uh, the way to solve problems. I do believe that there needs to be a concerted effort between central government, local government, the community to solve their own problem. Yeah. Instead of building a wall from uh, Cape Ranga all the way down to Stewart Island, let's build in our local communities. Let Auckland solve their problem, let Hamilton solve their problem. Yeah. But I do believe that the local government is key and they have to actually make the decision to solve their own problem and not look to government. Yeah, I think, I think they need to stop yakking about it and actually get on and do something also because I think I don't know I haven't sat in on a lot of the council meetings but um, I'd be willing to, to bet that they've talked about a lot of things yep. um, and gone and spent money on other other things that are not necessarily that essential yep. like a few developments around that the number of people watching this will probably will probably generate a list of um, but when it comes to these harder issues that they think they are going to be difficult, I think they just need to stop umming and ahhing about it and actually sit down and, and go, OK, we're going to do something about this. It's time we went to the community and discussed it with the community, uh, community openly and asked for their input and actually started making some sort of progress rather than just sitting in a, 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 around a table chatting about it. Um, I think this, uh, the key is not to look at the problem and solving it from a profit-making point of view. Yeah. Um, you need to look at it as a humanitarian emergency, uh, from a humanitarian emergency perspective, and look at a problem and say, these people need houses, let's build low-cost houses. It means no one's going to make money out of it. Yeah. Right? The minute you, you give a contract to a contractor uh, whose uh, focus is on making as much money as you possibly can, you're never going to have low-cost housing. Yeah. I think we need to also look at the fact that um, you say no one's going to make money from it, not in the terms of being paid to do something, but I think in the long run we gain from it in the form of money and it being an investment in the future because if we fix a problem like this now it makes Hamilton a better place in the future and whichever city yep. you happen to be in makes it a better place in the future so therefore things potentially if this is, if this all comes together things like uh, crime go down Absolutely. therefore you may not make money but you save money and if, if you save money it's pretty much the equivalent to making money anyway Absolutely. so crime goes down um, people are, 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 are happier industry goes up jobs can go can go go up uh, people coming to Hamilton in the case of Hamilton visiting Hamilton 
may happen more because they feel safer in the in the place because the whole community has come together on something so not only have you sorted a housing problem but you've brought a community together that's taken responsibility for these things and gone okay we're going to fix this we're not going to stand for homelessness we're also not going to stand for these other negative things in our community that have been slipping by unnoticed okay. um, we're going to come together as a community and not stand for those other negative okay. things either yes what local council can do is actually bring the people to the table to have that discussion yeah unless uh, and we look to local council for our guidance why do we do that because we elect people to represent us yeah and we have an ob intrinsic right to ask them to honor their fiduciary obligation to represent us and yeah. one of the things that they need to do to represent us is actually get our point of view yeah and to get that point of view you have to actually invite us to the table and yeah. have that discussion yeah and not make personal conscionable decisions that are totally unrelated to the points of views of the people in the ward that you represent right yeah, yeah. you've got to have that consultation process happening yeah to to the council is concerned yep. in the case of hamilton this this case being hamilton city council um don't be afraid to go and ask the people get input from the people talk to them don't just make assumptions about what we may or may not want go and actually interact with people and say how can we work together to solve this problem in yep. our city and potentially lead by example in the case of Hamilton lead by example as to what the rest of the country can do because if you don't ask the people you're not going to easily get an answer because people will be uncertain as to whether you're going to listen to them you can tell whether or, whether or not this is an issue uh, housing or lack thereof of, of uh, people that can afford it cannot yeah. afford it you can tell if this is an important issue if it's actually on the agenda yeah if yeah. it's not on the agenda uh, it's not important yeah and if it's low down on the agenda you know it's not relatively important yeah it needs to be relatively high in the agenda yeah and i believe it's not on relatively high on the agenda when people in positions of power and authority exercising public power are comfortable yeah the only reason why someone would discuss an uncomfortable issue is because it's made them uncomfortable or they are part of the issue yeah and yeah. the suffering so I uh, again I say to you the housing problem can be solved really really quickly you, all you have to do is quantize how many houses you need to build if for example we need about a thousand houses in Hamilton it's really easy you set the goal you identify how much it's going to cost and labor and um, resource terms yeah and then make the commitment yeah if you don't make the commitment if you don't even quantize the problem, you don't make the commitment to solve it, you're always gonna have the problem. And what's gonna happen is that there's gonna be social tension. Yeah. That's gonna be felt by the poor people. And whenever there is oppression, and wherever there is a high poverty, you're gonna see the crime rate go up and up and up and up and up yeah. and up. And the people that are gonna suffer are those who are gonna be criminally victimized and those criminals are going to be sent to prison and then we're yeah. going to have to pay to look after them in prison. Yeah. It's a lose-lose situation. Yeah. Why do you do that if you don't have to do that? And we don't have to do that. Yeah, we can, we can solve a problem by sorting it out instead of waiting until we have to send people to, to jail and people having to um, put barbed wire around their properties to protect themselves and all this sort of thing we can solve the problem a long time before right. it gets even close to that. We have people that have a social conscience, we have people that don't have a social conscience, we have a people that do have social conscience but don't, aren't able to, to contribute at the moment, and then we have people that don't have a social conscience and don't care. We've got a, yeah. a variety of people that do and do not and can and cannot. Yeah. There's a lot of people out there that want to, probably want to contribute just don't know how or have the medium to do so because as individuals they can't really contribute as far as they see Correct. but if they come together as a group with people who um, can enable them then they can contribute a lot yep. we have a constitution obligation even though we don't have a written constitution we, um, the courts have always said that the three principles of the treaty, uh, partnership, participation and protection, 
mm. our constitutional principles. Yeah. We have a constitutional principle to participate in the discussion that enables us to identify how we can assist those who are in need. Yeah. We can then protect them from themselves and protect ourselves from them in the event they get peed off yeah. and take it out on us, not now, but maybe in the future. Yeah, because even though those three principles come from the, from the treaty, they are actually, they cover a lot more than just the treaty. They cover the whole of society. There is, in and effect, a treaty between each individual yep. which those principles apply, yep. right? And if we look at it from that perspective, right. then we can move forward. Those fundamental principles existed long before the treaty came around. Yeah. And those fundamental principles were built into each one of us. It's yeah. called a survival instinct. Yeah. It's my survival it's is dependent. equally dependent on your survival. Correct. Because if we work together, Correct. we can both go someplace. That our collective synergy is greater than the sum total of our individual yeah. synergy. Um, and the, we call that, in um, uh, um, simple terms, we call that a social conscience. Yeah. And there's there's a there's a old proverb I can't remember um, exactly how it, it goes, but effectively it's if everyone in the canoe paddles in the same direction, we will get to the destination. Yeah. If we keep paddling in different directions, we're not going to get anywhere. It's going to go round and round in circles. One of the things we're going to have to get past is the prejudice we have against those who cannot help themselves. Yeah. We usually say, um, one of the things we say to ourselves is, oh, they're in that situation, they made the choices that they made and they resulted in, the result of that is they're in that situation. Well, sometimes those choices are imposed on them. What happens if a kid has lost their uh, mother and father, they end up in a foster home and they go from foster home to foster home. And what happens if that foster kid has been abused? Yeah. What is that person going to be like when he becomes an adult? What happens if that kid decides, oh, stuff this, I'm going to go join one of the gangs and I'm going to F you fellas up yeah. when I become a member of the gang and you didn't provide for me, so I'm going to take. Yeah. Also, there's the, the aspect of, so someone may have made a decision in their 20s that was bad um, and then it's taken them till they till they're 40s or 50s before they've started to realise that they need to make change, should they be told that they know you made your decision in your 20s, you're stuck in that lifestyle, that's it? Or should they be given an opportunity to step outside that and start making that change? Yep. Because even though they're waiting until they're 50 before they realised it, if they even if they start that late in life, they're still going to be A, a better person but they're also going to help other people to start to recognise that they need to make change. Correct. You've uh, identified two issues uh, that um, are in at variance with one another. We're talking about housing, yeah. and we're talking about people making change. Yeah. Are we going to uh, uh, wait until people make the necessary change before we help them with the housing problem? Or are we going to sort out the housing problem now? So that they can make the change. And so that they, we can assist them make the change. Yeah. This is not a, a handout for nothing. Yeah. Uh, there comes an obligation once you help somebody. Yeah. And that obligation is to change. Also, whatever resources we contribute, whatever it is in time, money, resource, um, uh, equipment, uh, you name it, whatever contributions are made. If we build a home, guess who owns a home? The community. Yeah. They don't lose. Yeah. How can they lose? If we build a thousand homes, like for example, unrealistically in 12 months, who owns the homes? The community owns yeah. those homes. Also, I think as a person that's been helped, you have a social responsibility at some point in your life to pay that forward and help back. So even if you've contributed at the time you're being helped, there is a point where somewhere in your life and their you, can, you can help someone else out Correct. in some way, whatever it happens to be. Correct. You, know, you may, in this process, learn a skill that 20 years down the track Correct. you can give back to the community Correct. by like doing what you're saying, taking a, taking a month off to, to help renovate people's Correct. places. We call that in, in my 
Maori uh, society, we call that utu. Yeah. Reciprocity. Yeah. Obligation to return love for love. There is a negative side to utu as well. We have a right, when we have been abused, to turn, return hate for hate. Yeah. And I'll, I would rather and go for the first, first iteration for the first. of that, not the second. Yes, let's encourage love, not hate. Yeah. Let's help uh, if we know uh, we can help and uh, let's do it now rather than later. Yeah. So I think uh, the best way forward is develop a strategy. One, local government has to make, put that issue on the agenda. Yeah, I, I think local government does need to stand you up and say, we're going to take action and we're going, to, we're going to make central government sit up and pay attention and do something. We're not going to wait for them to lead it, we're just going to get up and do yes. it. I believe once you've made a plan, I don't believe that local council can solve the problem on its own, but it is the responsibility of the local council to formulate a plan which identifies what the central government's responsibility is, what the community's uh, responsibility is, or what the community can yep. contribute. Set a goal, set a date, identify what needs to be done to achieve those goals uh, within that time frame and get it done. Because as a community, we can't afford to still be in the same situation we are in 20 years' time. Uh, we're going to be in a worse situation well, if yeah. we don't solve the problem. But yeah, if, if it but it's going to be a it's not going to be a monetary one. It's no. going to be a social one. Yeah. We're going to have a pre oppression begets oppression. Yeah. Hate begets hate. Yeah. Love begets love. Yeah. Um, you help someone, and in the, the Māori community, you help a Māori. He's obligated to return that love. Yeah. And um, nine times out of ten, he will sacrifice almost everything that he has to return that love. I think if People and you are, uh, told me about a gentleman yeah. that uh, made you an offering because of your helping him, and he made an offering to you that you he only he could do. He knew he could do, and he was committed to doing that yeah. for you, uh, even if it put his life in uh, harm's way or danger. Yeah. But he felt an obligation to return that love. Yeah, and it was a thing he could return. Great. His situation, skills, whatever, may have been limited and he could only see that that was the only option he could offer as a return. Um, whether or not I choose choose to accept it or not, yeah. I acknowledge that that's what he can return. I may never make use of it, but um, he was given the opportunity to. And I think no matter what race or, or um, culture you belong to, this underlying process of someone's done something for me, I have an obligation to return back, not necessarily to that individual, but to the community as a whole, um, or someone else who comes along and need, pass it on, I think pretty much goes through any community, doesn't matter what race or religion or belief system or, or whatever you, you belong, you are, I think that pretty much underpins any community. You see that a lot in the military. You see that a lot in the armed forces. When you hear the cry, man down. Yeah. The mission changes. Yeah. Whatever the mission is, it's no longer the mission. It's yeah. the rescue of the man that's down. Yeah. So uh, I thought uh, I'd share those comments with you. Cool. And well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to have these little clips. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for the, for the chat. It's been very enlightening and very interesting and I hope it's just as interesting to people watching it. Well I've got a funny feeling that uh, everybody knows now who's been watching this that I'm, I'm looking to um, prepare for the October 2020 elections for position in um, national government. I have a, a feeling that's building in me that perhaps I need to uh, look at uh, uh, securing a seat in local government to yeah. help here. Are you? Cool. If I can't help my community and and I am in a position to help my community, what does that say to me if I uh, say no, I'm not going to help my community, I'll just focus on uh, uh, getting position in central government? Yeah. I think it's wrong. Yeah. So uh, I uh, I remember you and I having this discussion about what the mean, what the word kura means, yeah. kia ora. Okay. When I say kia ora to you, 
I'm saying to you, be well. But I'm also making a promise to myself that I will contribute whatever I reasonably can to help you to be well. Yeah. So that's what the word kia ora means. Yeah. Cool. And so uh, I, uh, I thank you for this time and uh, look forward to uh, future discussions. Yeah. Cool. Thanks very much.